Well, welcome everybody to today's Talk with Doc. It's my honor to have uh, my good friend, Andrea Moriarty with us. And today I'm excited to be talking about uh, a topic that is near and dear to any parents and, and we, we wanna make sure we help them with that. But it's basically gonna be how to be the advocate that your child with special needs requires. Um, and you know, the, one of the things I always have said is if you're not your child's best and strongest advocate, who will be? Um, and so that just kind of will kick off today. Again, anybody who's with us live on our Zoom, you can place any questions you have today in our chat or the Q&A, and we're happy to get to those. If you're watching on Facebook Live, I'll be streaming that and be watching the comments there. If you got any questions, please place them in the comments section there, and I'll be pulling those in. Um, and so you can ask Andrea or myself any questions live today. But Andrea, why don't you just take a minute, welcome and introduce yourself. Tell us about you and, and everything you do. Yeah, thanks for having me, Doc. Um, it's true what you said. I mean, I don't think any of us set out to be advocates, <laughs> but as a mom, you love your child so much that that's what you become. And um, so, but here's, here's, our story. My husband and I have been married 30 some, 34 years. And um, seven years, we very much wanted a family. Seven years in, we decided to adopt um, after just getting frustrated with the infertility process and deciding that, you know what, God's in charge of this, not science. These doctors are just hoping it'll work. And God knows, you know, when conception happens. So we put our faith in him instead of the doctors. And um, two weeks later had twins. <laughs> I, I got a call from um, the adoption facilitator who asked, would you ever, have you ever, con would you consider twins? And, you know, I say, I had thought for about five seconds. I didn't know you could ask for that. <laughs> so we adopted twins at birth, a boy and a girl. Wow. Thinking that adoption would be our, defining kind of experience. But then um, at 18 months, two years, classic story of diagnosis, we learned that Reed had autism. So autism sort of trumped adoption in terms of our, um, you know, issues that just defined our journey. And um, we moved a lot. The kids were born in San Diego, where I am now. And we, my husband's career took us to Chicago for a year, San Francisco for a year, all in that sort of um, early intervention uh, period of 18 months to two years, which was very stressful because as we were realizing what was going, well, it was stressful, but it was also um, fortuitous in the sense that our pediatrician here was kept telling me I was comparing a boy and a girl and just relax, kind of treating me like a you know neurotic first time mom. Right. Don't worry about it, don't worry about it. And we moved to Chicago and that doctor, new pediatrician whose wife worked at Easter Seals and she immediate, he immediately recognized um, Reed, you know what it was he recognized I don't often include this, but since you're a doctor, <laughs> um, he recognized that Reed would hug him and Reed's a hugger, right? <laughs> I, I, I love my Reed hugs. <laughs> Reed would hug him, but would not, but would resist the doctor's touch, you know, initiated touch to Reed. Sure. So, I mean, that was one of the little things later that he, he told me um, so he was just much keener at picking up on the red flags and sent us immediately for an early childhood eval. And then we were on the path. Um, Roughly how old was Reed at that time? Andrea? 18 months, exactly. 18 months, okay, 18 months. 18 months. And um, I had raised all the red flags on the little flyer that's now in pediatricians offices, but this was 20, Reed's 26. So 26 years ago, those little flyers weren't around. Autism Speaks didn't exist. But going back now, I can see, you know, appears as death, 
<laughs> cries unconsolably for no reason. You know, all the checklist I had raised and the pediatrician just dismissed me, the first one. Second one jumped on it. So, um, I mean, that's kind of an example already of advocacy, right? If Absolutely. your doctor doesn't listen to you, uh, keep asking or switch doctors. <laughs> because a mother, even an adoptive mother, knows, you know, and even a first time mother knows. Absolutely. So, yeah. And, and I'll jump in on that real quick from a doctor's standpoint. That's one of the things I learned early in practicing pediatrics. If I ever had, especially a mom, there's mother's intuition is so important. And moms out there listening, please never give in to your mother's intuition. Actually push it and get answers. Because every time I've had a mother with mother's intuition that something was wrong, something was always wrong. If we couldn't find it, we had to dig deeper, but it was always there. So uh, I, I echo that completely. Any parent out there, keep pushing until you get the answer you need. So yeah. go ahead. Just switch, just switch doctors. Like yeah, absolutely, get a second nothing opinion. wrong with that. Just get a, get a different, different person. Um, because I think in life, right, in, in all things, you can always find someone to agree with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no matter what opinion or issue or topic it is. And so if you have the hunch, just listen to it. And, the, but the awkward position is, that you're in is that you, I wanted that first pediatrician to be right, right? You're in, you're in still in this denial and you're hoping you're wrong. Um, and so the more he told me, oh, don't worry about it. The more I thought, well, you know, I hope he's right, but you're spending so many hours with this baby at that well toddler at that point that um it's also undeniable and if it keeps recurring you know go with your go with your gut so anyway that started our process and then you know moving during the time of setting up programs was a little tricky because we set them up in chicago then we moved to san francisco and then i said to jim i can't keep doing this i can't be new with this child who is um embarrassing me in public, you know, <laughs> make me look like a bad mom. But, you know, he was challenging behaviorally. And so we were new neighbors in a new church. And I just, I couldn't deal, you know, I was like, I can't keep doing this. So where are we going to settle? Let's move there and stay because I got to set up a program and I want neighbors who know that what we're dealing with and can come alongside and help and not, um, I don't have to be explaining myself all the time. Right. So at that point, we came back to San Diego. Um, my husband took up surfing the first time we lived here. <laughs> and so there's no going back to Cleveland. Um, although they do surf on Lake Erie, I'm told, but he's, <laughs> he's been spoiled. So we're back here. We moved back when the kids were five. Um, and we've been here ever since. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's been a long journey. You know, Reed's gone to five different um, he went to, he went to five different schools, four of them non-public that the district paid for because, um, they didn't have a place for him locally. And that advocacy looked different in each season. And I don't think I even called it advocacy. Um, well, I'll tell you another pediatrician story, which was the first time I, heard the word advocate. <laughs> um, when we came back to San Diego, I got a new pediatrician, did not go back to the one, but had a new one who was a woman. And at that point, I was asking her about autism programming and getting plugged in here. And she said, I'm going to give you the name of two moms who are both incredible advocates for their boys on the spectrum. They're about your you know, same age as Reed. And at the time, I thought that was such an odd description. Like, what do you mean? I mean, she didn't say, oh, I think you'll hit it off with them or they're nice, they're great moms or they, you know, she said they're both ab great advocates for their, <clears throat> for their boys. And it was just, it just struck me as a strange way to describe, you know, a, a family or a mom. Right. But in fact, those two, one, one of those women, I called them both and we um, shared therapists, tutors, resources, you know, sob sessions, crying around the lake, walking when we could, 
that was before you would text your heart out, you know, to another mom, but <laughs> we um, were close and, and resources for each other for a long time. One of them moved away, moved to Texas, but the other one is still a close friend and our boys were in a band together and those moms, um, you know, were invaluable at that time when you can't, you have so many needs, it's kind of a, it can become an unsurmountable or unbearable task. So you need help, you need others around you. And sometimes another mom knows more and sometimes another mom is just more available and has more time than the a professional might. Sure. So that's, that's one thing I would pass on to, um, to parent advocates is surround yourself with other moms who have the same, um, same values, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd, I'd piggyback on that and say, dads do the same, you know, don't, True. don't pitch in your hold yourself. Dads. That's one thing that dads are so guilty of is they don't reach out and talk to others and, and men will say, Oh, I can handle this all myself. Um, but it's okay that you don't, and you don't have a clue what to do. Find other men. And there are some great organizations that, that help you out. If you need help with that, let me know. Um, you know, we, we can uh, help get you hooked up. But one especially is the, the Special Fathers Network that the, the amazing. Um, and uh, uh, that and I'm a part of that. So um, wonderful thing. So any dads out there listening, we got to get you connected too. Um, it's not yeah, just that's a, a really good point, Doc. There's a group here, um, NFAR has a mom support group that meets monthly and they have a dad's group. Um, and I mean, to share kind of a personal story on that, I think I did a lot of the heavy lifting in our family, especially early on. Part of that was because my husband was, um, he, he just was really busy with a, with a fast moving career, which is sure. great. And, um, but I did that and, and he, you know, we had good communication, but he trusted me with everything. And that's, that's great, but it's not ideal. <laughs> I mean, he trusted me with it and I could just make decisions and, and run with things. But we did reach a point, um, again, I'm looking back over a sweep of 25 plus years or 20, well, since diagnosis, say 23. But there was a point in Reed's teens where, um, I realized, wow, I'm looking at, you know, there's a, there's a trap if a mom is in charge independently in running these programs, that the, the caution is to not let life revolve around the special needs child. And, right. you know, I'm guilty of doing that for a season. And there was really a critical point where I realized, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm, um, uh, Jim's going to, Jim, not, not that he's going to leave, but there was a point where I'm like, I've got to decide, is this going to supersede um, our marriage? And I think that happened maybe in part because I was doing it all myself. And so that's, that's a danger. Um, your first, yeah, your first teammate should be the spouse. Absolutely. And the dad, and, but dads need different help. Dads need other dads. Right. Absolutely. Agreed. And then there's a, a great thing for having support group where you as a couple can be in it. And, and you know, we, we offer through SOAR, we offer support groups. Anyone out there looking for that, it's virtual. So you can join from anywhere around the country for that. And, and it's open for couples or you know just moms or just dads, however you want to come. It's the third Thursday of every month from 8 to 9 p.m. Central Standard Time. Um, so if you're interested in that, just contact us at info at sourcespecialneeds.org, and we'd love to have you be a part of that. Um, but, you know, Andrea, you're, you know, you're talking about several of these things. Um, talked about, you know, that, that pediatrician and the whole first part there. You know, like we said earlier, being an advocate is such an important job, um, and we need to do so much. Um, now that you've gone through, you know, so many different stages with Reed, why don't we kind of go back to the beginning and just talk about how we can 
be the best advocate that we can be for our child kind of at those different stages as we go through. Okay. So mm -hmm. Let's kind of go back to like the beginning, our early intervention. Um, and how can a parent be a good advocate? And what does that look like? What does that mean? You already said, you know, finding a doctor that'll listen and help. That's one of the big keys. But what are some other things that you've done and would recommend? Yeah, well, I, you know, in preparing for this, I was thinking about what is advocacy and here's how I'm gonna define it. Doing whatever it takes to get what another person, which is your child, needs. Yeah. And I think that's what, that's what a parent advocate does is do whatever right. it takes to get what this child needs. But there's two parts to that. You have to know them well enough to know what they need. And then you have to know what's available and where to find it. Yeah. So what I, you know, early on, if I go back to preschool, read entered a um, early intervention preschool here in San Diego, and we had, an, and he had everything um, from, in terms of services, you know, he, had speech, OT, um, music therapy eventually. And he, you know, he had a whole really thick IEP, but, but he was little, he was only five. So it wasn't, it wasn't too big yet. <laughs> yeah. But um, I initially, um, you know, you have to research what's available and what are the best services and then go interview and meet all these people. But once you, once you pick the therapist that you like and want to work with, and maybe they come through the school district or maybe they come through insurance and private selection. But um, I was very, and I was like an adrenaline pumped up adoptive mom. I was gonna, you know, so I, some of this we came at, um, the adoption was a leg up in terms of our energy that we put into this. I, and I knew these, I knew I was going to have to study our kids to know how they were uniquely created, created and what made them tick. Cause we couldn't assume they were going to have either one of our temperaments or appearances. And so I was already kind of bent that way to like figure out who are they and how did God make them? And I think that's important to know what, kids need. And then you have to find out what's available in the community. And then I poured myself into learning what these folks were doing. So I, whenever I could, I mean, I chose therapists that would let me sit in on sessions. So I remember roaming around Mary Quar's backyard, you know, doing the auditory therapy and swinging in her helicopter swing and all those things. She helped us outfit Reed's bedroom. So it looked like an OT clinic. And, um, I was a stay-at-home mom, so I also didn't have to report to a job, which is a huge difference. But as much as possible, I think that it's really important to learn the therapies, to learn the therapies, because then you're doing them more often during the week and you're naturalizing them into the, um, that sensory diet just became part of our family lifestyle, whether it was having a tramp or having a, you know, beanbag chair and the swings and reads um, ceiling, which is the room next door. <laughs> you know, we just took those big bolts out, but we had a contractor resupport the beams, you know, to support right. his weight. And um, so it's, it's knowing what they need. And at the early stage, that's a whole lot of education. It's educating yourself about what is autism. It's spending time looking in his eyes and figuring out what's he not saying and, and what's he communicating on verbally and what helps him and doesn't help him. And then finding what's available in the community and which, which things does he gravitate towards and um, you know all those things. And then um, I remember there's a story I wanted to tell here at that stage. And he was in, he was in a district preschool program and um, I was to go to kind of his first IEP meeting. I, I wanted him to be in a church preschool that was up the hill with district aides. And that was a little bit of a sticking point, I guess, in the IP process. And I was calling other parents at that point saying, how does, the, how does this work? What's an IP? What do I say? How do I get what I want? <laughs> and um, I'll never forget 
this woman I called, I don't even remember how we got her name. I think my husband worked with her son and he had a sister with autism who's 10 years older than Reed. And I called her the night before the IEP, kind of in a last ditch, you know, um, attempt to get intelligence. Like, how do I do this? And she talked to me, she shared, you know, their experience, shared some of the law, which I hadn't learned, right? Right. Uh, of how IEPs work and, and how, um, how the system, it's a system basically. Absolutely. And it doesn't, the system, I didn't know this then, but now I know it's a system. It doesn't respond to logic. It doesn't respond to need necessarily, but it's a system. And so you have to take what you know about your child that you want to get for them. And then you have to figure out how to get it through the system. And I didn't have the detachment at that point. I just was like, you know, um, the demanding parent. Anyway, this woman said to me at the end of the phone call, who's going with you tomorrow to the IP meeting, right? And I said, well, no one. <laughs> and she said, what time is it? Where is it? She drove 30 minutes, you know, with the, the next morning, she's like, I'll be there. You can't go to that alone. And I think that's another defining thing of advocacy is not only can't our kids do this alone, I mean, they can't navigate a system, they need an advocate, but also no individual parent can do it alone. And so you need an advocate. Even at that point, I didn't know enough to hire someone professional, um, but I needed another mom who at least knew the, the jargon and the buzzwords and the, and the system. Right. And she came, I don't think I've seen her since, <laughs> you know, it's not like she wasn't a longtime personal friend, like the other two moms, but she just was not going to let me go to an IEP meeting alone. Yeah. And I tell moms that all the time now, it, you know, when they call for, um, for help and more in the school age range is, you know, I tell them, don't, don't go to an IEP alone. And um, we had an advocate later in life who just paid for, we only paid her for the meeting time. So she wasn't a lawyer, she was an educational advocate mm -hmm. that was more affordable. We paid her whatever her rate was, you know, a hundred and something an hour just for the meeting time. And I tell everyone, you know, you, you will get that back it, you just, you have to do that. You can't go, you yeah, can't go no, easily. I agree completely. Our meetings, when Reed hit um, <clears throat> grade school, I remember in about fourth grade, and I, I pulled him in and out and did homeschooling for season, <clears throat> excuse me. But um, we would have, say around third, fourth, fifth grade, we would have IP meetings that would go for four hours long, be tabled, and they would reschedule for another four hours, you know? So these were these were enormous, um, 12 people in a room and just like, my husband would go, you know, he's an executive, he would go and he would leave. He, he was like, I can't sit here for two hours. Like this is and longer than two hours. He's like, this is absurd. It's It was so ineffective and inefficient to his business brain. And he's like, you know, this is ridiculous. And the story about the advocate that we had was when I hired her, the first time I hired her, we used her for years, but the first time I hired her in about third grade, um, she negotiated what we wanted, worked the system in advance of the meeting and our IEPs went from eight hours over two days um, to one hour long. And we walked out with exactly what we wanted. Yeah. So, as much as you want to be a parent advocate, you also need a paid advocate. And that enabled me to be friends with the people around the table instead of the, the bulldog that she was. Right. Yeah. And, and so I'll, I'll add a couple of points kind of go along with this. Um, <laughs> one of the first ones, especially when we're dealing with the early childhood and early intervention, it's okay if you don't know what to do yet. And it's okay if you're not ready to act on that because frequently we have to get over the grief. We have the grief of losing the dreams of what our typical child was gonna be. 
And that takes time for you know us to go through. Um, and we may not be ready to fight and do everything we need, or even as you said, Andrea, be able to do that. That's okay, and we need to go through that. Every single parent goes through that that grief process um, with it. I did with with my son, and then you know I I agree completely on being the advocate, especially in the IEP meetings. If you can get someone there to help you, um, we had that with our very first IEP, and it's usually those first IEPs that are always the hardest because um, for us. My son had autism. He was in a school that did not have the services, but they did not want to move him because they would lose money. They would lose funding for the school, even though the teacher admitted to us she didn't know what she was doing. Right. Um, so we had a professional advocate, educational uh, uh, one that we hired that came in and helped us. We met with the team. We had a long meeting. And for me, it got to the point we were losing. They even had the, the PhD from there, from the district. And the advocate turned to me and she said, Doc, I think we're going to lose this one. It's up to you. Say whatever you can to win it. And I just pled my heart, shared what I believed needed to happen, why. And I broke down. I started crying. Hmm. Um, and I was in a room full of women. They all started crying. <laughs> And I won. They gave me they gave me a three month trial. And mm -hmm. one week later, they came to me and said, "We are so sorry. We were wrong. You were right. He will never go back again. He will stay in specialized classes the rest of the time." Wow. And it's because of fighting for my child because I knew what he needed, and that's what we need. If I was just passive and took what you know she said that no, you can't do it, we would have all lost. But because I sat there and said, I'm going to fight and I'll go down fighting. And sometimes we lose and that's okay. But mm -hmm. we got to fight for our kids. Um, mm -hmm. and, and again, it comes back to if we're not fighting for them, who does? Um, so keep up the fight. And if you can get the advocates to help you um, along with that in the IEP, it does make such a world of difference. Uh, right in the IEPs. Well, that's also the power at the heart of a father, right? They're not used to seeing fathers in meetings. Absolutely. And so that's a really powerful. Yeah. Um, and, <clears throat> and that would be the other thing. If you can get dad to come along and be there, that that does all, uh, wonders in the, in the meeting. And, and mm -hmm. dad can speak a lot of power and a lot of truth in there. And then, you know, like they, they all told me, if, if you can ever get a dad to break down and cry, they will always crumble because um, they, they're, they're going to lose it with that and when they see how passionate you are. So. Right, right, right. And yeah. I think maybe this is a good time too to say that, um, you know, we've had great teachers. As you described, it's always a budget issue, right? The, the In an IP, the district, there's an agenda. <clears throat> Excuse me. The district agenda is to save money. And that's, that's part of the system. What I mean by a system is the, the district's trying to save money. We want things that cost money. And the teachers really do care about the kids, but they're disempowered in the, you know, they, they're the ones that see your child and work with them each day. They know them to an extent. They're never going to know them as well as you do because they just only know them for a year. Um, but even if, but they they don't have they don't have power in that equation, um, and so their hands are tied. I mean, I've had teachers come up to me and apologize after a meeting. I'm so sorry, you know, we, we really wanted him in the class, and right, <laughs> you know, they're they're powerless. Um, so it's that that's I think, and and as you say, we're emotional as parents, and you you don't always. Um, I mean, while it can be a powerful plea you also ne aren't necessarily thinking clearly, which is why it's nice to have someone else there with you to even help remember what happened because right. your, emotions, your emotions cloud that uh, a little bit. Absolutely. So yeah, I, I think we're kind of transitioning now with, with us into our elementary um, mm -hmm. you know, time. Mm -hmm. So you know, outside of you know, working with IEPs and advocates there, um, what else can we do to advocate for our, our kids? Um, especially through the elementary years. Then. Yeah, I, I'm looking at my notes here. You know, I think um, I, I have follow your gut <laughs> again. 
you know, we did, um, we did a lot of music therapy because Reed had a lot of non-compliance and a lot of um, behavior and music was the one area, it was the one therapy he didn't avoid, right? Whether it was at home or in a classroom when there was music involved, um, he was attentive and engaged. And so we really leaned into the therapies that worked and, and for us, it was music. Um, and I had to trust my gut to do that, right? I mean, there are people right. who maybe would have said that was a um, secondary modality, but um, he learned everything he knows from music, whether it was potty training or math facts or the planets. And um, we had a music therapist who's been in our life for um, 20, more than 20 years. She was, she was right out of an internship program here when she started, um, moved here from Iowa. <laughs> she, she now read sang in her wedding. She just had twins. So our lives are connected in, in lots of ways, cool. um, which my husband reminded me to say, you know, <laughs> as much as we say that teachers won't be in it for the long haul, there are these exceptions of therapists who you connect with and they become part of your family. And we have, we have several of them. Um, one was his, his, an early intervention aid in our home sent by the district and has since moved, married a pastor, has two boys. I was in her wedding, you know, and she, she was named Reed's, um, she, she would have been the kid's guardian, you know, that's how close we are. Now they're, old enough that, you know, she's, she may be on the conservator board, but <laughs> in any case, I'm saying these are people we, we met as therapists in our life and we've stayed connected and that's invaluable. If something happens to Jim or I, Absolutely. Um, now I'm jumping ahead, <laughs> you know, ultimately the part of an advocate is to teach our kids to function without us. And yeah. because Reed's 26, we're rapidly approaching that he just moved into his own apartment. And now my job is that an advocate is very different. It's not to um, spin him in a chair, you know, <laughs> 15 times in each direction, right. but it's to trust others. And I think that happened in elementary school that began to happen. So not only did I follow my gut um, and use music, even though it seemed fluffy, um, but I also had to trust others. I, I, and maybe more so in high school, you know, I had to start to say, well, they may do things wrong. They may not know that he doesn't like X, Y, or Z. You know, they don't know all his idiosyncrasies, but I'm going to have to trust him to others mm -hmm. because that's the future. And that's how he's going to learn independence and self-advocacy and be able to clarify questions for himself. If I'm always there talking for him as an advocate, he's, there's no necessity for him to say, don't touch me. Right. Right. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't like people brushing up against him, but I can't run interference. Um, there, there comes an age, you know, where that's not age appropriate. <laughs> I probably did it longer than that point, but um, it, there's a, you know what I'm saying? You know, there's a, you create a necessity. Now he does that for himself. Yeah. And um, so that's, that's part of being an advocate too, is trusting choosing people wisely, choosing the classroom, getting to know the teacher, but then trusting them for that eight hour day to do their thing and to provide something that maybe, um, you know, another teacher couldn't. Right. Yeah. And I think along with that, you know, uh, is especially on the therapy thing. I, I like what you said there. Um, realize not every therapy modality is going to work for your child. Mm -hmm. and you don't have to do every therapy modality and you know if you're not seeing the benefit from it it's fine you you can um you know uh move on but uh you know you've got to find what works for you and go with that um and and mm -hmm. that's that's important and so just be that that person you can fight yeah i used to say that we um I mean, I have a couple, a couple things coming to mind, but I used to say that we needed exceptional everything. We didn't just need a good enough doctor. You know, we need an exceptional pediatrician. We needed an exceptional dentist. Reed had his, a lot of his dental care under anesthesia. 
um, until recently, you know, though, I mean, he's gotten so good at that. <laughs> but initially, you know, we'd have to go to Children's Hospital to get a cavity filled. And um, so we needed an exceptional dentist who could navigate that. We need an exceptional anesthesiologist because that wasn't easy either. We right. needed exceptional neighbors <laughs> because, um, you know, they, they were in close proximity to everything that we were doing and we needed exceptional, he has an exceptional sibling. <laughs> so you need, um, you need people that are really good and it's important to choose that choose those people and if and if they aren't if you don't feel like it's effective keep looking or drop it like you say there's also i remember um there's a point of diminishing returns with this uh, when you are scheduling um therapies <laughs> and you know I am guilty too of overextending myself and my kids at a phase when they were in school all day and then we would just be racing up and down the highway 30 minutes to the best OT in town and 30 minutes back for something else, you know, scheduling a social group at night um, and then coming home and doing brain highways patterning exercises until past bedtime because we didn't finish the however many reps we were supposed to do for this class or the other thing. Um, Jim did step in at one point. He's like, you know, enough, you gotta, you gotta stop this. It was just, so there's a, there's a point of, um, like you say, if a therapy's not working, drop it because more is not more exactly. in these kids' lives. And you have to evaluate uh, your family life. And that in itself has value for creating engagement and relationships and longevity more so sometimes than another 50 minutes of oral motor, you know, exercises. I, I remember another summer where I looked out, we have a little office with a, with a window that was Reed's um, ABA room when he was little, then it kind of became a homeschool room. And there's one window that looks out at the end of our cul-de-sac. And I would look out there and it was summer. Of course, we didn't quit. <laughs> we didn't quit. Program ran and we had therapists coming in and out of that room all summer long. And um, I looked out the window and I saw the kids, the other kids on the street riding around on bikes and tricycles and having a great old summer. And I... Um, thought, man, here we are like slogging it through making this, it, it wasn't even school, playing school. I mean, it was like grueling um, work. And I made a decision like you're encouraging people to do <laughs> that year. And I was just like, you know what? We're taking two weeks off. We're just gonna quit this. And you worry, you worry as a mom that, oh, they're gonna backslide or they're gonna lose skills if you take a break over summer and you've gotta do extended school year. Mm -hmm. But there's, and I agree to that, I agree with that to, a, to an extent, but there's a the point of diminishing turns, returns that you're so busy and they're so busy that there's no time to even absorb all the good stuff that you've been doing with them. So it, it's give yourself freedom to take give them a break and take a break. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and then the other thing that you said too, with getting the, the neighbors, that's so important. Um, you know, especially as our kids can get out or wander, um, you know, making sure all the neighbors just know, Hey, if you ever see, you know, your, my child out and I'm not with them, help us out, grab them. Um, and that's another way you can be an advocate for your child. Yeah. Um, when we First moved back to San Diego, we actually had a meeting. I haven't thought about this in a while, but we had a meeting at our church and invited the neighbors on our new street and our old friends and the church folks, you know, basically everyone we knew in San Diego. And I, we had the OT come down from San Francisco who um, knew Reed and she did sort of an orientation. Now, you know, he's diagnosed with autism and he's back and these are his needs and here's how you can help. And you can do that through a gathering like that or you can do it through a note. We just, we just as I said, is in this apartment now, 
two miles away with living staff, but he, um, we just sent Valentine's little, little um, candy and a note from him, which he wrote once in his distinctive handwriting and we Xerox, but kind of introducing himself. Hi, I'm Reed. I'm your new neighbor. I love living at Solana Highlands and see you at the hot tub. You know, so it's simple, but it's, and it's from him. So it's, he's his own voice, but he's, it's basically that same thing. He's introducing himself to his neighbors and letting them know I'm in J5 and right. the handwriting tells them I'm a little different. And there's a lot implied, right? And I'm walking around here and you're seeing me and, but I'm part of the neighborhood, so. Yeah. Well, Andrew, we got one question while we're on, you know, elementary here that just kind of came in. Um, one of our uh, attendees said their child was just tested and found uh, that she has autism. Um, she doesn't know if we know about a, a CBR classroom or recess classroom um, and wanted to see what our thoughts were with that. Um, again, those listening, a, a CBR classroom, um, there's a couple terms that that could be. It could be either a center-based um, uh, classroom or a community-based you know, rehab type classroom um, with that that are used frequently in, in some schools. Um, so do you have any thoughts with that or anything? I don't really know that term. You know, I mean, we have different terminology in different states. Right, right. Um, I think generally speaking, I, and I don't know what a recess, I don't know either of those terms, but I think generally speaking, um, inclusion is great. I mean, the title of my second book is Radical Inclusion, which is more about including adults in the community and it's a call to action to have the communities embrace people of all abilities. Um, for when we're not there as parents to, <laughs> to do that. Reed's always gonna need a friend at Panera and a friend at <laughs> the grocery store. So, um, but that said, I'm all, I'm all about inclusion, <laughs> but you, there's, you, you have to do it um, wisely and only as much as the, your child can tolerate and absorb. And so Reed was very rarely in a typical classroom and very rarely included. In fact, my, that's why I wrote the second book with that title. The first book, the chapter on inclusion is the shortest one. I only had one story to tell. It was about a singing contest he entered in high school. And he was, that was at our public high school. But he was, until about 10th grade, he was always in a pullout special ed classroom with other folks with behavior and special needs. He didn't have very much inclusion with typical peers. And that's for a lot of reasons, um, partly the school and partly his profile. So we sought out, you know, really the church was the place where he had the most interaction with typical peers. And while I would have liked more inclusion, it's not positive if you have a child who throws himself on the floor and is screaming all the time, the inclusion with typical peers isn't positive anyway. It's just another sensory overload. So it has to be crafted carefully. Like we, we had play groups on the street where I'd invite two more mature neighbor kids over with a music therapist and would have a music circle time. So I'm, those were better positive experiences with Reed with um, typical peers than recess at the local school where he was just falling apart. Right. You know, and, and what I'd, I'd say to our listener here, you know, I, I know a couple of school districts here locally are, are using those and it, it depends on your child, you know, especially new, try it, see how it works. Um, it may work very well and you'll know after a period of time if it's not working, then that's where you have the follow-up IEPs and talk through and, and see what you can do next. But um, especially some of the kids with autism, they, they seem to do pretty well uh, with that. And it's kind of, there's some different hybrid models with that. So I definitely would-, it, would it, has to, it should be crafted carefully for success. Right. 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 Don't just do inclusion for inclusion's sake. Absolutely. But craft yeah. the inclusion so that it's successful and both parties are learning something positive. I agree, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. All right. So let's jump to high school age. Um, mm -hmm. You know, things change um, here now. So there's so many different areas that just come to mind that we can be an advocate. So um, mm -hmm. what do you say for our high school years with parents stepping up to be the advocate their child requires? Mm -hmm. Well, I think in high school, being an advocate is stepping back, right? And letting, letting, um, the, letting your child develop some of their own um, independence and individualism and um, self-advocacy. So like I said earlier, it's kind of trusting those people that are in a place to help them. That, that goes through, that's a common thread. I mean, I remember having to trust the nursery workers, you know, on Sunday morning. <laughs> but, um, but in high school, you really want to wean off the mommy and me show. Uh, I mean, Reed and I do a lot together, but um, <laughs> it, it's not healthy. It's not age appropriate for high schoolers, let alone these, some of his peers now um, who, you know, where they're close to 30 years old. And to still be hiking on a Saturday with mommy and grocery shopping with mom or dad isn't really age appropriate. So I think in high school, um, advocating for them is, is letting go. It's also looking for other trusted people in their life, whether it's a youth leader at church, whether it's an older teen on the street, um, uh, male babysitters, you know, who can be role models that step in and have that influence that you can't have as a parent. Um, and then I used a lot of the time that Reed was in high school. Um, and for him, the high school years were a lot about developing that social because he was at a public school with typical peers. He was developing socially. It was less about academics. It was more about um, social. And he, he would make a friend on campus who was another teacher. His friends weren't typically the other high school kids, but they were, they were the teachers who he would deliver lunch to. Right. Um, and, but I used that time to really research adult programs and figure out what was going to happen for him after high school. And, um, because I, because I had a block of time to do so. <laughs> and when he, because he wasn't leaving for college, um, I wasn't going to have, I knew I wasn't going to have that when he finished the transition program. So we, that's when Reed's podcast um, started. My husband and I were brainstorming what would he do after college that would be continuing ed and that would be engaging um, when, his, when his sister was leaving for college. And somehow we came up with this concept. It was really just trial and error. Like, what if we, what if he had a podcast? And I thought, well, he could interview the people who, um, professionals in our community, autism professionals and teachers and OTs and these, these people that he sees anyway. And my husband kind of, he's a marketing um, <laughs> professional and he's like, nobody wants to listen to that. <laughs> Nix that, he's like, let's get him to talk to people other people want to meet. And I'm like, well, who, you know? So we started just emailing um, celebrities, musicians, the head writer at Sesame Street, you know, and people that Reed found interesting, but also that the general public would. Yeah. And so that he now has 90 podcasts, as you know, yep. um, online. It kind of, COVID took a little break from that. But anyway, we, we in our travels back home to see family and all over the country, started to set up interviews and that was amazingly motivating for Reed. It would motivate him to fly places, to um, go to new places, try new things. And it really became his continuing education to learn about these different fields and then have a set of podcasts that he could listen to and have the repetition um, and, and, and learn from as well. So um, during high school, it was kind of crafting that adult vocation in our in our minds, you know, and it happened bit by bit. But it, the birth of it was during high school with my thinking of thinking about what's what's he going to do, and is is he really going to want to sit in a community college class, which some of his peers enjoy, but I 
you know, we didn't, we didn't go that route. We instead, Reed's, Reed's an entertainer and a performer. And so we kind of crafted this. Um, now he's got a YouTube personality and presence and, and different shows and he's in a band and he performs. And so it was kind of, again, leaning into that, that Angela, the music therapist we've known so long, she first developed that in him by inviting him to perform with her. Yeah. And so for me, it was, it was kind of uh, leaning into that again and crafting it as something that could be generate income for him and also be motivating and get him out of bed in the morning um, you know, in lieu of school, that what would be interesting and what would he be willing, you know, to do. And then we use that to teach all sorts of skills, whether it's not teach skills now, but employ skills like writing and making friends and Googling things and, yep. um, fine tuning his skills with an acting coach and voice teachers and so forth. Yeah. Um, so, I, and I also think the other thing about you know, the high school years is defining success. What is success going to be for your family? Do you need your child? Do, do you want them working, making a certain wage? And is that reasonable? You know, Reed was working at a pizza place during high school for an hour a week. Um, we could have continued that path and had him, and, and he, he does to an extent, but that only works for him in short blips. So he was before COVID, he was working at Panera two hours a week and we were ready to add a second day. Um, but generally speaking, that's not, um, that's, that's not the best fit for him, but he has, he has friends who work, but I think you have to carefully define success. And so success for us was he doesn't need to make money. We need him to have a reason to get up in the morning and feel like he's using his gifts and has a has a ownership of some um, something. <laughs> it, it, and I think what you guys did is is so important that every parent needs to do, and part of their advocacy is, you know, find what your child is passionate about and help them in that. And it doesn't necessarily need to turn into career or anything, but that's something that they can do, and it just helps them, and that helps create community. And, and everything else but you know I, and I love this you know uh, a couple have also uh, said you know they love the term that you said uh, craft adult vocation uh, because that's really you know one of the things that is so important there and and that we need to be doing there um, mm -hmm. you know we're coming up on top of the hour you know time goes so yeah. fast let's jump to adulthood uh, real quick um, so so many things that need to do but it's completely different. You kind of were already getting to it with the the high school that you know you kind of have to back off and hands off some adulthoods now that transitions a little more. But there's a ton that you have to be an advocate for to protect. Yeah, well, we moved Reed into his own apartment a year ago, um, and it's a process. So now I have a little teeny bit of hindsight on that. <laughs> um, that process, you know, we'd set up the conservatorship and our attorney gave us a letter of intent, which we were to fill out, which I never did. <laughs> and then, um, you know, we had um, Emily Coulson's circle of friends, which I set up and invited people to, to be circle of friends, kind of setting up these things that would sustain Reed when we're not here. And you do those, you feel pretty young and like, we don't really need to finish that yet. But then when we chose, um, we thought let's, it's gonna take him a while. It may take five years to get used to living in his own apartment. So let's start early and let's just see how it goes because if it doesn't go well, we still have time to look at other options. And so we just started down this path thinking, um, it's trial and error, right? We're just gonna try and see. And every night when he leaves at four o'clock, my husband's like, I can't believe this is working. Like, I can't believe he goes willingly and he watches the clock. I gotta be back to my apartment at four o'clock, you know, to make dinner and do the hot tub with Sasha. She's, she's expecting me. And so it's been very empowering and um, for him and very much of a pleasant surprise for us because we yeah. never thought we'd have an empty nest even for 
four hours at a time. And now every night, it's like date night. It's really kind of wild. But um, the process of choosing a supported living agency um, and then setting up onboarding the intake process with them caused me to write everything down. And so that's my advocating for him now is to create those documents that take my brain, everything I know about, you know, how he likes his mashed potatoes <laughs> to um, what kind of shoes he needs to wear, just all that minutia and putting it on paper so that his live-in staff roommate knows it and so that her supervisor knows it when that staffing changes. And um, it's been very, it's fascinating. So now those documents are done. And um, as long as someone's reading them and looking at them, you know, it's, it's there for them. My role as advocate now is managing staff mostly and um, choosing and recruiting staff and defining what kind of person works well with Reed. Um, we, we're gonna run out of time, but that we have a training this Saturday. So I'm training, training up people um, the way that I think they should be. And I'm not doing the training, I've found someone to do it, but yeah. it's, it's managing staff and helping them be successful and feel confident interacting with him. Um, so it, it changes a lot, but it still comes back to, I'm doing whatever it takes to get what he needs. And what he needs now is to feel successful as an adult doing it without mom. And so I'm doing all that back end support, you know, to make, make that happen. Yeah. Love that. Andrea, thank you. It's been awesome today. Um, anyone listening, first off, want to shout out for your books. Um, I've got go. Radical Inclusion <laughs> here. Um, I don't have your first one because I gave that away and I don't have another copy. You've got it there. Perfect. There it is. Um, 15 there it ways is. to amplify um, as well as uh, all, all of Reed's music. Reed's um, CDs. Reed's CDs are awesome. So you can check all this out on, on Amazon. Where else? Go to Amazon to get it or... Um, Amazon has my books, the music's on Spotify and iTunes. And then we both have a website, which is our name.com. Readmoriarty.com, Andrea yeah. Moriarty. So readmoriarty.com and Andrea Moriarty.com. Um, I highly suggest you check them out. Um, love, love Reed and, and the scene. You got to get my best to read. I miss, miss my bud. Um, got with the that, backyard with an acting coach. All right, awesome. <laughs> Just come home here to work. We got a bigger yard than his apartment. Yeah, but, uh, very good. Well, I think he might come up and say hi. He was excited I was going to be talking to you. But. Cool. Well, <laughs> we got some upcoming things I just want to let everyone know about. Um, first, uh, we are launching our SOAR summer camp registration on Tuesday morning, March, uh, the this coming Tuesday, which is March the 9th, uh, I think it is, at 9 a.m. So go to our website, soarspecialneeds.org, and register for that for both in person and virtual. We're doing two different camps. So if you live somewhere else in the United States, you can still participate in our camp. It's Soaring for Gold. It's an Olympic theme. It's the same week as the Olympics. So uh, we're going to have a ton of fun. Uh, if you're virtual, we'll still have a bunch of great opportunities for you there for that. Um, our next talk with Doc, we're going to take a couple of weeks off for spring break, but our next talk with Doc, I'm very excited about. It'll be March the 26th. And Jocelyn Ramos' Campbell is gonna be coming in, talking with us. And this is gonna be directed especially towards our ministry leaders out there. And the topic is gonna to be diversity and special needs, ways churches connect and engage with multicultural families. And I think that is such a timely talk and we need to see how we can welcome, not just all families, but especially welcome our multicultural families into the church. Um, as so many times, they just don't feel welcomed by uh, the way uh, we do things. So join in again, March 26th for that. We'll be getting the registration uh, up for that later uh, this afternoon or tomorrow for that. Um, and again, if, if you, uh, we've got a parent support group that meets every third Thursday of the month with SOAR. Uh, we'd love to have you participate in that. You can email us at info 
at soarspecialneeds.org and uh, take part of that. We'd love to have you there. We've got many resources and advocacy programs we can help you out um, with as well. But Andrea, again, thank you so much today. Is there any parting shot you'd like to leave us with on being an advocate? Oh boy. <laughs> um, let's see. Let's see. I don't know if I can put it into one, but I think maybe what's coming to mind is don't do it alone. Get help. Get help. And um, it's a it's a marathon, not a sprint. Oh, amen. Yeah. One told me that when Reed was three. That's a good. That's a good one. It, it is. And, and don't ever forget that. And and I agree completely with you. Let's lock arms with others. You know, a lot of people are around there, and sometimes you just don't know what you don't know. So ask lots of questions right. and, and find right. the help. But there are, no matter where you live, there are resources available for you. Um, and if you don't know, you don't know where to look or how to find it, contact us at SOAR. Um, we'll help you out. Contact Andrea, she'll, she'll mm -hmm. help point you in direction. Um, but don't stand back and say, I don't know what to do. You can be the absolute best advocate that your child needs, that they require. You don't need training for it. It's on the job training. You do it as you go. Um, and you don't have to be the best at it, but you're going to get better as you go. Um, follow your, your mom's intuition or your dad's intuition and pray, pray, pray. That's, again, for me, that's the number one thing we have to do as a parent is pray for our child every day. Because, again, if we're not praying for our kids, who is? Um, and we want to make sure we're bathing them in prayer and doing that. So. I yep. look forward to having everyone join us again in, in a couple of weeks as we talk on this uh, diversity. Um, otherwise, you all have a great week. Come soar with us. Bye-bye. Thanks, Doc, for having me. You bet. Thank you so much.